Welcome to Presents. I'm your host, Ben Kaiser. Today, we are joined by Dr. William J. Luther, Assistant Professor of Economics at Florida Atlantic University and Director of the Sound Money Project. Luther's research, which focuses mainly on currency acceptance, has been acknowledged and cited by multiple major media outlets. Luther is this year's lecturer at the Brandt Foundation Lecture Series here at Boise State, titled, Is Bitcoin a Bubble? Please join me in welcoming Dr. William J. Luther to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, I thought we should start the show today talking a little bit about maybe your background, um, how you got into currency, ex uh, currency acceptance, economics, things like that. Well, so I, uh, I studied at George Mason University for my uh, PhD. And while I was there, I was working with um, Larry White. Larry White is um, maybe the foremost expert in the world on the classical gold standard and on the, um, the redeemable banknotes um, in, in historically in, in places like Scotland and Canada. Um, so I guess you could say he's interested in peculiar monies and I kind of picked up that interest while I was there. So the big questions in my research are why we use some monies and not others and if we're looking at peculiar monies um, I think those are the kind of monies that uh, really uh, highlight that question. Why is that we would use a peculiar, peculiar money right, that makes those, um, the, the answers to those questions a little more salient? Can you give us maybe a few examples of some peculiar monies that are, that are in circulation today? Well, um, so one, one peculiar money is the Somali shilling, for example. Mm -hmm. So the Somali shilling was issued by the government of Somalia, but in 1991 that government ceased to exist. And so you might wonder um, what would happen to people who were using a money that was introduced by a government when that government no longer exists. And it turns out that in Somalia they just kept using those old government issued banknotes even though there was no government to manage the, the supply. And um, uh, the notes were, were unbacked from the start so they were um, what economists call irredeemable paper monies. You can't, um, if you take them to the bank, you know, they'll happily give you two fives for a ten, but it's not redeemable for some underlying commodity. But um, most irredeemable paper monies, like the U.S. dollar, benefit from some government support. A government will say, uh, we're going to collect taxes in a particular money, we're going to make our expenditures in that money. And here you have an irredeemable paper money that no government is supporting any longer and yet individuals kept using that money. And so that's an interesting question, like why did they keep using this money? Um, and, and you can think about that, uh, you can think about explanations that might not be so clear if we were looking at more traditional monies that benefit from that government support. So can outside organizations and agencies and countries find value in, in things like the Somalia, or the Somali shilling? Shilling, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so what I argue is that uh, individuals kept using those monies because they had become accustomed to using those monies. They were useful as a medium of exchange. They could reasonably expect that all of their trading partners were going to accept these notes because their trading partners had accepted those notes yesterday and the day before yesterday and the day before that. And of course their trading partners had similar expectations about them and so you get this um, a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right, where People keep using this old money on the expectation that others are going to keep using that money and others keep using the money on the expectation that still others are going to keep using the money and so it just kind of perpetuates itself. So what um, qualifies a money as a, you know, a, what was the term you used again? It was the, uh, A peculiar yeah, money? Yeah, peculiar money. Right. Yeah, so monies that are just a little unusual. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you uh, some other examples. Um, there are these places around the world called micronations. And micronations are really small, I guess you could call them countries, but they're distinct from what we call microstates because they're, uh, unlike microstates, they're not recognized as sovereign by, um, by respectable countries. Um, so one example is Sealand, which is basically an oil platform off the coast of, of uh, England, um, and it issues its own money. Uh, it's a population of maybe 13, right? So pretty, pretty small population. Um, so it's a, it's a weird situation. Why is it that sea land issues the money and why would anyone accept that? Um, I think most people look at that and think, yeah, that's kind of peculiar. So I guess I don't have a tight definition for what a peculiar money is, but um, you know it when you see it. So does, to transition then, does, does Bitcoin consider itself as a peculiar money then? Well, uh, at least at the outset, I considered Bitcoin a peculiar money. Right, right here you have an, an item which is uh, irredeemable, so it's not backed by some underlying commodity like silver or gold. 
Um, it's, uh, it doesn't have government support that pretty much all of our other irredeemable monies uh, enjoy. There's no government standing by saying, we will collect taxes in Bitcoin and we'll make all of our purchases in Bitcoin. Um, and so it looks a lot like the monies we use today without that government support. Yeah, I think that's pretty peculiar. So does something like that worry economists, the fact that governments are not you know, taking interest in this currency, but yet it's finding its own basis on the internet, or it's, it's finding its own usership outside of a, a national state or a sovereign you know, union? I think that economists, maybe more so than other social mm -hmm. scientists, are open to the uh, to the idea that individuals are um, typically capable of, of solving many of the uh, problems in their lives with, without the need for um, some kind of oversight or, 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 or government to provide services, um, uh, which isn't to say that governments can't provide you know, uh, welfare enhancing oversight or, or uh, services that benefit individuals, but I think economists more so than most social scientists think, look, if there's a problem, if there are some gains to be had, then, then there's an incentive for individuals to come up with a solution to solve that problem. Um, and it may be we organize in, in the form of government to solve those problems, or maybe we just organize as private citizens. But the, the underlying mechanism is the same. There's a problem, therefore there's an incentive to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. and so. Um, that, so that problem, if it's solvable, is likely to, to get solved. Do you see Bitcoin being the solution to any problems out there right now? Uh, I think that proponents of, of Bitcoin, big fans of Bitcoin, see Bitcoin as a solution to some problems. Um, and we can think about what some of those are. I tend to be pretty modest about um, the, the extent to which Bitcoin is a solution. So some people worry, for example, that the supply of, of uh, a traditional irredeemable money, like the dollar or the euro, but even to a greater extent, currencies like the Venezuelan Bolivar or the Argentine Peso, that those supplies, there's really nothing constraining those supplies. And as we've seen in places like Argentina or Venezuela, those supplies can grow pretty um, significantly in a very short period of time and that causes inflation and makes it very difficult for individuals to engage in day-to-day -day transactions. With Bitcoin, the supply is pre-programmed and so roughly every 10 minutes a, a balance of Bitcoin is released into the world that has never existed before. At the outset it's 50 Bitcoin per 10 minute period and then around four years later that was cut in half to 25 Bitcoin and then four years after that 12 and a half Bitcoin. And so it follows uh, a very tight supply schedule that's known and predictable and, uh, and you don't get much deviation from that supply schedule. That is, maybe it's not the best supply schedule, we could debate about that. But that predictability is something that no national currency um, can, can make claim to. The Does that make Bitcoin more reliable then in, in, in respects to certain other you know, currencies where you're not sure of its, of its population or its? So it makes it more reliable mm -hmm. in, in, in the sense of having a predictable supply. Now, I should say that it's, it's not so clear that what we want is mm -hmm. such a steady supply. Maybe you would prefer a money that the supply expands or contracts as the demand for that money expands and contracts. Uh, and so in that sense, then maybe the supply mechanism isn't so great. But in terms of predictability, you know, in the US, the Federal Reserve manages the supply of money reasonably well relative to other central banks around the world. But I couldn't tell you what the supply of money will be in a year or 10 years or 20 years, let alone 100 years. With Bitcoin, I can tell you, and with a fair degree of confidence, what that supply will be. And so, um, so proponents cite that as an advantage. Do you see any disadvantages to Bitcoin? Well, one is that supply mechanism, okay. right? So as the demand uh, fluctuates, um, there's, there's no accommodation in supply, and so the, the price of Bitcoin, the purchasing power of Bitcoin fluctuates as well. So in your opinion, what needs to change about Bitcoin, maybe cryptocurrency in general, for these, these national states and these countries to, to really accept it? And, and maybe see that first country that says this is our national currency. What, what, what has to happen in this crypto realm before we start to take it more seriously or serious on that kind of level? Well, I guess I would, uh, maybe I would push back on in terms of what it would mean for Bitcoin to be successful. I don't think you need uh, a country to adopt it. 
Um, I think that you just need people to adopt it, and a lot of people have adopted, adopted it. Um, in terms of government responses, they've been all over the map. So in some countries like the US, um, the regulatory approach to Bitcoin has been relatively light. Um, the effort doesn't seem to be guided by a, a desire to dissuade use. In other countries, um, that's not the case. So China banned Bitcoin exchanges. That makes it very difficult for you to exchange your yuan for Bitcoin or Bitcoin for yuan. Um, in Russia, there was a proposal to, to ban Bitcoin. Um, that hasn't gone through, but some worry that uh, it will be revived and it will uh, go through. In, in Bangladesh, you can spend 12 years in prison if you're caught using Bitcoin. Um, in other countries, um, there are restrictions on using ex external uh, currencies, and it's not clear whether that applies to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or not. Um, so you've seen just a big range of uh, policy responses to, to cryptocurrencies so like what Bitcoin. So what is currently regulating cryptocurrency? Well, um, it depends on what you mean by regulation. Mm -hmm. So we can think about regulation in multiple uh, uh, levels. So for example, the, the supply of, of Bitcoin and the, um, the validity of your ownership of Bitcoin, uh, of a balance of Bitcoin, is regulated by the Bitcoin protocol itself, mm -hmm. right? So if I transfer a balance of Bitcoin for you, we have this protocol in place that um, ensures that now you own this balance of Bitcoin and I don't. And that's a, sense of, uh, that's a sort of regulation that the system itself provides. If you kind of go out one layer from that, there's a community of, of Bitcoin users and miners and uh, developers, and they are making small changes to the, to the Bitcoin protocol. So maybe we want to, say, increase the, the, the block size uh, to enable more transactions to be processed with Bitcoin. That would be something that developers would propose. And other developers might adopt that, and the, and the, the Bitcoin miners who are processing transactions, if enough of them adopt that change, then it becomes legitimate. And so we have a sense of regulation there as well, kind of a, um, like a self-governing system there with the users and, and miners uh, all playing a, a role there in, in concert with the developers. And then if you go one layer out from that, you have uh, legal regulation. So in the US, if you're op op operating a Bitcoin exchange, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network requires that you register as a money services uh, business. Um, of course, you have to pay your taxes. <laughs> and so if you receive income in Bitcoin, you have to pay income taxes. If your Bitcoin uh, becomes more valuable between the time you acquire it and the time you sell it, you have to pay capital gains taxes. Um, you have to comply with know your customer laws. Uh, and so, so there's a host of regulations that are surrounding uh, Bitcoin um, on that legal layer as well. In your opinion, are there any regulations that, that we should see added sooner rather than later? Like what are the things that are, that are most important to sustaining the growth of cryptocurrency? So I would say that um, what, what's most important is just regulatory clarity. Mm -hmm. um, so there are very few states in fact that have, in the US, that have clear and narrowly tailored a regulation uh, relating to Bitcoin. Uh, Idaho happens to be one of them, so congratulations. Um, but, but many states have uh, overly broad and unclear regulations. And that, that ambiguity makes it very difficult for those um, who are choosing to whether, you know, whether to accept Bitcoin, um, either as um, uh, individuals or as businesses, uh, those who are thinking about maybe opening a company to help others transact with Bitcoin or, or an exchange to uh, convert dollars to Bitcoin or Bitcoin to dollars, um, uh, payment processing companies, you know, maybe a, there's someone thinking about opening up a, a debit card that would allow you to, to swipe at your local grocery store and, and that would be deducted from your Bitcoin balance. Um, those individuals are going to find it much harder to um, to have the confidence to open up those enterprises if they're not sure what the regulatory framework looks like. And so even if you have some, some marginally bad regulations, mm -hmm. uh, if you know what they are, you can, can consider how costly they're going to be to the operation and proceed. But if you don't even know what the regulations are going to be, it makes it very risky to, to move forward with those operations. So I would say that um, rather than thinking about what is the, the best 
regulatory environment for cryptocurrencies, um, we should first and foremost think about how can we make a clear regulatory environment uh, for cryptocurrencies and then make marginal tweaks from there. I think that the clear thing is, is something I want to touch on too because I, there's a lot of this feeling going around, especially you know, among colleagues I have, friends I have, that, that Bitcoin is something that's really hard to understand. Cryptocurrency is something that's really hard to understand. You know? And even in the prep work that I've done for this, I, I've, I've found that it's easier to get familiar. And what is it about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency that is making, it, making the early adoption of it so hard for people? Well, it's new and different. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. Um, you know, I'm a nerdy economist, right? <laughs> and so when I hear questions like this, I think about other nerdy I'm a, I'm economists. I'm so I'm right here with you. <laughs> um, and so uh, there, there's an article by, by Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz um, that was uh, published in 1984 uh, titled, Has Government Any Role in Money? And if you go back and read this article, um, one of the interesting things about the article is the tone of the article as they talk about um, the US dollar. Um, you know, it wasn't too long after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. Um, the Bretton Woods system, we didn't really have a redeemable uh, uh, money. We didn't have a money where you or I wouldn't have been able to um, go or to the bank and exchange it for, uh, exchange a dollar for a, for a balance of, of gold or silver. Um, but there was still the, the uh, maybe the illusion of redeemability uh, and redeemability uh, at least you know other countries could uh, could redeem dollars for for gold uh, after the collapse of Bretton Woods that was no longer the case and no one expected that that was going to be the case again and this was new and different and maybe regular folk weren't thinking too much about that but uh, but economists um, you know in this article we have two of the most famous monetary economists in the world at the time saying, wow, this is peculiar. This is a new kind of, of money that we don't have much experience with, and we're not sure how long it's going to last. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable today that um, you know, regular, routine uh, money users look at, at this new and different uh, type of money, cryptocurrencies, and think, wow, this is really peculiar. Is this something that's going to last, uh, or uh, is, it, is it just going to, to pass by? Um, so I think that's a very reasonable response to have. And so to bring back in college students like myself, though, you know, there was, there was almost a calendar year ago, right, this huge spike in, in people investing in Bitcoin, right? Like the stock is raising and, and all of these things are happening. And so what, what do you say to people today that still have their money in Bitcoin? People like myself who are, who are you know, maybe not as familiar, but, but got on that train and mm. now are just riding it. Well, so um, I would say that you know, you, you should be thinking about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin mm -hmm. um, in the sense of, you know, in the sense that you think of other monies that you might hold. Uh, what kind of transactions are you interested in making? And does this lower the cost of those transactions? Um, so if you are, you know, maybe you're working in the US and you have some, some family in, uh, in Chile, uh, it might be a, a cheaper way for you to send money back Right, rather than relying on Western Union for international remittances, it might be cheaper for you to, to send Bitcoin back that then they could uh, um, Rechange, exchange. Yeah. And, um, or maybe you're uh, conducting transactions uh, online, w uh, internationally, mm -hmm. and the, the, the sellers that you're interacting with don't have access to the international banking system. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you don't want to just hand over your identifying information to them. You don't want to uh, uh, open yourself up to identity theft or something like that. Then this is a medium of exchange that would be very attractive for making transactions. Or um, I'm sure this isn't the case here, but if you're purchasing illegal substances and you want a degree of uh, anonymity, um, uh, you know, offers that. cash, yeah. right? Hand-to-hand -hand currency is one way to get that anonymity, but another way to get that an anonymity is to rely on a, um, a, a cryptocurrency that promotes a pseudonymous exchange, uh, exchange where you don't have to reveal your identity mm -hmm. to make those transactions. And so depending on the set of transactions that you're engaging in, maybe cryptocurrencies are, are worth uh, having. Mm -hmm. um, if, you're, if you're not making those transactions, then it would be less desirable to hold cryptocurrencies. So I want, I want to talk a little bit about your lecture. And I think the easy way to start this out is just with the title of it. You know, is Bitcoin a bubble? Yeah. 
So it's, it's a difficult question to, to answer, actually, because economists define a bubble uh, as an asset that has a price exceeding its fundamental value. Uh, in other words, you're paying more for the asset than it's actually worth. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about an asset like a house, right? we can see what people are paying for a house, mm -hmm. its price, and we can get some sense of what that house is worth by thinking about the, the rental services that that house puts out over the course of the year or the course mm -hmm. of the decade or, or so on and so forth. If you're thinking about um, an asset that's a derivative of some other asset, right? Um, we can think about the price of that asset and then look at the price of the derivative, which is the fundamental value of the asset we're considering. With, with monies, especially irredeemable monies, yeah. monies that aren't derivative of some other asset, it's tricky, right? What is the fundamental value? We observe the price, mm -hmm. that's easy to see, but the fundamental value depends on how useful this item is for making transactions. And that's very difficult to estimate. And so I guess the, in asking the question, is Bitcoin a bubble, rather than thinking um, uh, of, of what the answer to that question is, I would prefer to highlight just how difficult a question that is to answer. Mm -hmm. It seems so obvious to most people. They look at the price of Bitcoin, they see it shoot up, they say, oh, must be a bubble. Mm -hmm. They see the price fall significantly, and they say, ah, it must have been a bubble. But they're using that term bubble without any reference to the fundamental value. And so before we conclude that Bitcoin is or has been a bubble, we should start by thinking about the fundamental value of Bitcoin and whether it's possible that the fundamental value of Bitcoin was fluctuating and can explain the variation in price so has, that we observe. Has Bitcoin's fundamental value been made known yet or are economists still trying to figure that out? Well, it's, it's very difficult to estimate, mm -hmm. right? So we can never know it with absolute certainty. It's not observable. Um, we might be able to form some estimates about it, but we can think about things that would affect the fundamental value of Bitcoin. Things like changes in the regulatory environment. So for example, when China bans those exchanges, this makes it a, a lot more difficult for all of those Chinese citizens to exchange yuan for, for Bitcoin and vice versa. That means that Chinese people are gonna be much less likely to use Bitcoin and since you and I might transact with Chinese people, mm -hmm. it makes it a less valuable medium of exchange for us because it's no longer a medium of exchange we can use to transact with all of those people. Um, on the other hand, if, um, if, a, if a government makes it very clear that they're uh, not going to impose some draconian rules mm -hmm. on cryptocurrencies, then you and I can be confident that we're going to be able to transact with those uh, uh, other, other, other people. And so that makes uh, Bitcoin uh, more useful for so us. Is it, so is it this rapid ownership and then lack of use creating these bubble-like symptoms within the cryptocurrency era? Is that, is that what we're getting at? Well, I think that what we're seeing, people are trying to estimate what the future um, user base of Bitcoin is going to look like. If we expect that there are gonna be a lot of users, then that makes Bitcoin very useful as a medium of exchange because you can transfer funds to a lot of different people. On the other hand, if the user base is pretty small, right, that's like having a, a telephone when none of your friends have telephones, right? You can't call them, so it's just not very useful. Right. It's the same with the money. If you're the only person in a monetary network, it's not a very useful money, and so you're not willing to pay very much for it. And so every day, every, every hour, every minute, we're getting new information that causes us to subtly adjust our estimate of what that future user base looks like. And so when we, ex when we get new information that suggests that user base is gonna be bigger, we bid the price up today. Mm -hmm. And when we get new information that suggests that user base is gonna be smaller, we bid the price down. And so you get a lot of fluctuation as a result. So in the interest of time, do you have any final words or thoughts for, for people who already have Bitcoin or looking to get into it or just generally concerned about cryptocurrency? Yeah, I think, you know, I think cryptocurrencies are, are very interesting. They uh, offer a lot of promise in terms of financial privacy, um, and they provide a constraint on some of the 
um, less desirable actions of, of central banks around the world that might otherwise expand their money supplies in undesirable ways. Uh, and so I think that there's a lot, of, a lot of promise there. It's also still a new technology, so it's hard to tell exactly uh, the extent to which that promise will be realized. Um, but it's certainly worth watching in the meantime. So one final question before we end the show. Do you, are you invested in any form of cryptocurrency? So right I hold now? a little bit of uh, cryptocurrency. I like to joke that since most of my work uh, involves cryptocurrency mm -hmm. uh, and, and Bitcoin, that uh, owning Bitcoin is a lot like owning your own company's <laughs> stock. So maybe I'm already overexposed to cryptocurrency. So I hold uh, just a little bit. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Luther for taking time out of his schedule to join us on the show today. Um, that's all the time we have. This has been Presents, and I'm your host, Ben Kaiser.